get up, get, get up, get up. What's up, Mets fans? Welcome back to episode number 152 of the Mets Up Podcast, the official podcast of the New York Mets. We have an episode with substance. You guys know the big thing we got to talk about here is Justin Verlander has signed with the New York Mets. So we're going to talk about Verlander coming in. We're going to talk about Jacob deGrom going out. We also have got some just crazy stuff going on. The winter meetings have been hectic since it started. Trey Turner to the Phillies. Aaron Judge maybe going to the Giants at the time we're recording this. John Heyman has tweeted 10 different things, all of which have his amount to, to nothing. But we're going to talk a lot about baseball today, which is exciting because we haven't had a chance to do this in quite some time. So make sure you guys stick around, make sure you listen, and make sure you're following us on all our social media, at MetsUp on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. If you're looking for the YouTube version, go to the Mets YouTube channel, go subscribe over there, and you can watch the video version of this. And if you're listening to us, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Odyssey, drop us a rating, drop us a review, make sure you download and subscribe. All right, James, how you feeling, man? What's up? I mean, good. Long weekend with between Justin Verlander and, as you guys also know, Jacob deGrom, possibly Aaron Judge. The winter meetings are starting. We told everyone to wait for the winter meetings because that's when a lot of the action would start to take place and just happy there's a lot of action taking place. No, it's really nice. It's refreshing, especially uh, as someone whose job depends on being able to make videos about news that's going on. It's nice that the Mets have been involved because that helps with the views even more for me. Definitely. It's, it's, I, I tweeted it and it kind of got a couple couple likes. First tweet over a thousand likes in a while. felt kind of good. Now, no, starting to feel like baseball is back. But it's just amazing that we live in this timeline right now where the Mets could lose the best pitcher in baseball and then like also sign the best pitcher in baseball in one shot. A hundred percent. It's so it, it's refreshing because we know what it is like being a Mets fan in the past. And if we would have lost Jake DeGrom in previous years, I think our signing that would have replaced him would have been really, really, really disappointing and lackluster, more of a mid-level guy that you would have been like, okay, he would have been good for depth, but that's not the guy who replaces DeGrom. And here we get Justin Verlander, who's not only replacing DeGrom, but has been really really good i mean you want to find someone that's really similar in terms of like production value over the last few years that we've seen verlander was the cy young last year you can't really ask for too much more definitely i think it's also interesting to like look at the two different contracts these guys signed justin verlander of course being significantly older than jacob Degrom. he's here for two years 86.66 million dollars total of 42.33 million dollars annually with a vesting option for another $35 million if he throws 140 innings in 2024, which is not even that crazy of a number to hit. And then compared to DeCrom, who has barely pitched over the last two years, made like, what, 25, 30 starts in two seasons, five-year deal, $37 million annually, with a club option on the sixth year that has some of the craziest caveats I've ever seen in my life on a contract. And if you guys haven't looked at this contract yet, Spotrack, we shout out all the time in this show, is one of the best resources for Contracts in all sports, you can see contracts by position, contracts by team, caps for other sports, like NBA, NFL. It's really an incredible website. Jacob DeGrom's six-year option will hit with the Texas Rangers for $30 million if he either finishes top five in the Cy Young one time over the, over the length of his contract or throws 625 total innings in five years. So barely more than like 125 innings per season. Then that contract will become $37 million for that sixth year if he gets three top five Cy Young finishes or 725 total innings, or he throws 160 innings with a top five finish. And just the word healthy was in quotation marks in 2000. I believe that will be 2027 season. Yeah. I've never seen an option like that in the history of the league. No, it's very, um, I don't want to say cre it's creative. Is that the right word? Is creative what we want to call this? It's not the worst word. I just, I, it, it's so funny that that was like probably such a major haggling point, like how they got to those numbers in this negotiation. For sure. And I mean, like, especially seeing what happened with Verlander now, too. I think if there's any Mets fans that are, you know, out there that were concerned when you saw Jacob deGrom leave, the money wasn't astronomical, which sounds crazy when someone's getting paid $37 million a year. But as we know, guys have gotten paid more. I think a lot of Mets fans probably expected to see five for 200 in their head as like that was going to be the number. And when it came in less, they were like, what happened? But you got to know that, especially after you see them spend $86 million on Verlander, it wasn't a money issue. It was just a length issue. It's hard to give a guy, like you said, who's made 25, 30 starts over the last three years, five years of $200 million, basically. Absolutely. If you look at the last three seasons for both of these pitchers, Justin Verlander missed two of them, and Jacob deGrom pitched one complete. It was a shortened season and half of two of the other. Jacob deGrom barely even threw more innings, Justin Verlander. Like That's how much Verlander was able to throw last year. And of course, that's no... That's not any given that he's going to be able to throw a ton next year. Still is a 40-year-old guy coming off Tommy John surgery, just a basically a year and a half ago now, but it's it's it seems like the Mets 
one wanted to make sure they weren't committed to anybody super long term where they didn't think they could really trust durability wise that much. And two, just they wanted to create like a more stable floor of innings because we've talked about a lot in the show. The Mets lost a lot of innings from last year's team to this year. You need guys who can rely on for innings. And while Jacob deGrom's ceiling is certainly higher than Verlander, I don't even think that's necessarily close at this point in their careers, which we'll talk about a little more later. You're probably more certain that Justin Verlander will be able to settle in and at least give you the volume that you're not positive with Jacob deGrom. Yeah, no, I mean, Verlander, they, they, they're both just elite level pitchers. They're both really, really good. And I think a lot of times I can get lost just because of what the conversation is and what the narrative is and about one guy leaving and another guy coming in. But I think what Justin Verlander did last year is super impressive. Like coming off of Tommy John like that, I think me and you both, when we were doing my pitcher rankings and going over, like we thought we we're going to be the top pitchers. It were like, how do we rank Verlander? Cause we just didn't think he was going to be able to come back as strong as he did. And as we know, he was the best pitcher in the American league this year. Like, the guy is addicted to pitching. The guy constantly wants to get better. The guy hasn't really slowed down at all. It's weird to say about a 40-year-old guy, but I feel really confident in him. I'm at least confident, like what I said before, like the worst, I'm not going to say anything. I'm actually going to say, I'm not yeah, taking that completely mouth. back right now. Just, I, I think we I think we can count on, if not like top, 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 top level talent, we can count on innings. We can count on innings, we can count on commitment, we can count on a guy who's addicted to the craft. And there's nothing else you could really ask for when you give someone this much money. And we got Jeremy Hefner, too, to work with him and get him get him going with that little Jeremy Hefner special sauce, the sprinkling of the dust. He's going to he's gonna be even he's going to be incredible. What is going on in your neighborhood, by the way? I mean, it's just this New York City. There's sirens going on. I, I'm thinking maybe with this new mic, you can't hear that. But I know we can always hear more things when we do this recording than the people out there can hear, which is yeah. just really, really funny. Something yeah, else good about Verlander talking about his commitment, his like refining his craft. There was a story that went around over the weekend that he. Bought the, he sold his house in Los Angeles and bought one like in Jupiter, Florida or something like that, correct? Yes. Yeah, I did. And see like that. The, the, media, the media frenzy around it was like, oh, my God, Justin Verlander bought a house the same time Max Scherzer has a house. This has to mean something for two, two just grown men who may or may not be friends. He did buy a house, though, where his trainer, Eric Cressy, who we've talked about before in the show, is one of the most critically acclaimed physical trainers and uh, pitching physical trainers in the country. That's where his training facility is. So Verlander, 40 years old, wants to, it's like, I want to be as close to my guy as humanly possible so I can stay on top of it. Yeah, no, I, I like it. I mean, the guy, he's 40 years old. Usually when guys get Tommy John at that, they kind of just call it. They're like, I'm good. I made my money. I, I've won. I've done this. I've done that. I've all, had all the accolades. And I mean, that's probably one of the reasons why Justin Verlander is going to go into the Hall of Fame. The dude is just addicted to pitching one of the best pitchers we've seen in our lifetime and it's nice that we get to pair him up with max scherzer former tigers teammates too we got to call up uh, rick porcello we got to bring all the all the guys back anibal sanchez is he still around i mean doug fister i'm sure we can get doug fister on a minor league deal non-guaranteed contract oh no rick porcello i think i was about to say i thought i saw the other day that doug fister formally retired but that was actually rick porcello who formally retired ricky uh ricky ricky cy young Former Mets. No, tell Steve to open up the checkbook. We can get him back. But we also should caution Mets fans. While Justin Verlander is still incredible, and he's like he won the Cy Young last year, one of the best pitchers in the league, he still probably isn't the Verlander that you guys have come to know. Because any like any guy who's this age, any guy coming off Tommy John surgery, there's going to be some changes to the repertoire and the way they pitch. And Verlander did miss significantly more bats last year than he had any of his last like five like pretty good years that run with Houston until he got the surgery. But he was much better at limiting hard contact, especially at keeping the ball in the yard. And how many home runs you give up? A lot of times that could just be noise, but he is coming to a park that's not very easy to hit home runs in, that's City Field. So I am confident that he'll be able to hold these changes and just just keep keep the line moving, keep pitching well, and be one of our two aces. He's just super good. He's super good. And I, I think something that's really important, too, for Mets fans to keep in mind, too, is and you mentioned, alluded to it earlier, was the two-year deal. So he's got the two years. Scherzer's got the two years left. There's a lot of guys that come off the books going into 2025. So it very much seems like right now, this is the win-now scenario. The Mets are going for it. And I feel like as a Mets fan, it's kind of all you can ask for is because everybody's here for the next two. You know what you've got. You've got your core. Now it's about finding those pieces around them to help supplement this team and make them a World Series champion. And we've heard a lot of members of this front office try to compare what they're trying to build organizationally as something similar to the Dodgers did when they were bought out by the Guggenheim group. And if you look at the way the Dodgers have built this dynasty, those first four-ish years, they just put as much money on the table as possible and said, let's go as far as we can, see what happens, just dump it out there. They made the Adrian Gonzalez move. Um, that was Carl Crawford, Crawford. too. There's some, some kind of, I think they signed a pitcher, too, but it's eluding me right now. And then that happened. But while that was happening, and they were just replenishing their farm system over and over again, very quietly, very secretly. 
very, very low key, getting your prospects in there, not trading them if you don't have to, and just making sure you build that up. Because building up a farm system takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of time. It's hard to build up a farm system while you also have like a winner on the field. It's almost yes. it's very difficult to those things are usually mutually exclusive, except for the best organizations in the league. So the fact that the Mets are able to just keep bringing in these guys, spend the money because that's a resource that we have an abundance of, especially relative to other teams in the league. It's also not our money, so it shouldn't nope. be an issue at all. Get these guys out there. Keep winning baseball games while you have two superstars at first base and shortstop or in the primes of their career, and then keep everything moving. And then you could look up in four years whether we have a championship or not and be like, oh my God, the Mets have one of the best farm systems in baseball. Now we can do anything we want. Definitely. I, I feel really good. Like I think me and you both had an idea that DeGrom probably was going to be tough to bring back just because of the length, like we said. So I had an idea. I said a word for it in this podcast. I said, no, I I said he would be the first dominant to the Rangers. <laughs> you did you did call it. it. Clap it up for James, everybody. He did cre- get it correct. Uh, I The second one looks like it's coming too, although uh, we don't know about Judge just yet. But with the way that the Mets team is set up, with the, the roster and everything, like this is a really good start into what is hopefully building a better team than we had last year, which I mean, it was a really good team as we know, but... Yeah, Verlander, I'm really excited with that. I just, the DeGrom thing felt like a swift kick to the dick a little bit of like, uh, that 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 stinks, even though we kind of knew it was going to happen. But getting Verlander at least, like, I feel like should reassure every Mets fan, like, okay, all right, all right, it's going to be okay. Like, we're still going to get our guys. We're still going to be here. The timing is one of the things I thought that was the worst about DeGrom because it just happened a Friday night out in the city. Like, I was at um a bar in Midtown, hanging out with some old friends. Shout out Jack Dempsey's, well, the spot, aiming the goat. Amen. And one of my friends, two, my I was there. My friend was a Mets fan. My other cousin was a Mets fan. Another one of their f- friends was a Yankee fan. And it was just like everyone in the bar. The second everyone got the alert, just started talking about it. the bartenders were talking about. People at that table were talking about it. And just all of a sudden, there's this like flush of everybody getting the same news at the same time and wanting to say something. And there's a lot of emotion for Mets fans because Jacob Degrom, for a lot of people probably listening to the show, a lot of Mets fans, you guys all know, you guys specifically, it's probably the most talented Met you've ever really seen in your lives. Because yep. unless you're around Mark and I's age, you kind of miss David Wright's prime. And then besides that, no one has sustained as much as Jacob deGrom in the last 20 years. So to see him just, what? I was going to say, especially on the pitching side. Like on yeah, the pitching definitely. side specifically, like outside, like everybody knows who the greatest pitchers are in Mets history. Tom Seaver, Doc Gooden. And then it's kind of Jacob deGrom is like that next guy. It's just unfortunate that we could never get a ring for deGrom where those other guys got one at least. Yeah, is it, that that was the feeling of it. And we had this conversation. I wasn't mad that Jacob DeGrom left, but I just was a little bit sad. Yes. And it's almost just more like it's a, there's a new stone being turned over in everyone's lives. Like Jacob DeGrom's not going to be a member of the Mets. Like he was a member of the Mets from, from the second he was drafted. It's been a very long time he's been a part of this organization. You watch him go from like complete, unheralded, underdog, nobody to becoming one of the most, one of the greatest pitchers in a, in a single year or a multi-year window that we've ever, anyone's ever seen. Yeah, no, I, I definitely have no animosity towards Jacob DeGrom. I'm not going to be, you know, upset at him. I can't blame him. Go get your money. Go get your bag. Take care of your family. All the cliches. I mean, it's true. And I, I think we're going to be okay. I really do. I Whenever the Rangers come to town, I think it's the end of August. I want to say it's the 28th to the 31st. If Jacob DeGrom makes a start or if he walks onto the field, whatever it is, I'm going to stand and clap. I mean, he's getting a standing ovation for me. And also just a little bit of solace knowing that almost no other team, including teams that were in the mix for DeGrom, the Yankees, the Dodgers, I believe I said I heard the Padres were in there too. Apparently everyone yeah. was offering three year deals with a fourth year option. And the Rangers went above and beyond to the fifth with the sixth. And also no income tax in the state of Texas. So that thirty yeah. seven million dollar contract in Texas would have been around fifty million dollars in New York money. Yes. It's a huge difference in money and one that it the gap would have been so impossible to bridge, especially when it didn't really things that have come out in the last few days without it not corroborated at all. It just seems like he was ready for a new chapter. I can't blame him. I can't blame him. I mean, you 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 tried really hard. I don't think there was ever a doubt of that. So I think the Jacob deGrom era is officially over now for the New York Mets. That picture of deGrom, Harvey, Wheeler, Syndergaard, Mats, and Bartolo, it's officially dead, which feels really... I got goosebumps talking about it. It feels a little weird because that was like, you know, those are our guys and... Now they're all gone. It's a little it's a little weird to close, I feel like, that chapter of Mets history now. Yeah, and there was there was so much anger around it, I feel like. People on social media were going nuts. Some of the writers who you guys all know were yeah. really just saying some mean things about him. And maybe maybe Very they have mean. a different uh they have a different viewpoint of Jacob DeGrom. Maybe they spent more time with him or time with him in different instances or arenas. So maybe they have reasons for it. But it was just it just really felt like a lot of people were piling on a guy who did a lot of good for an organization that wasn't super cool. Don't get me wrong. Like it's upsetting that we see him leave and like 
see him get so much money from somebody else. But it, was, it seemed like there was a lot of a, uh, it was a lot of a. Uh, I don't, I don't hate. Uh, I hate sour my ex girlfriend. She didn't break I up. Mean, yeah, right? sour. She, grapes. she didn't break up. What'd you say? I said sour grapes. It's it's very like sour grapes from a lot of people. But for me, I take it more as it's it's bittersweet. So bittersweet. One of our favorite words in this podcast. Also, just that idea that like the Mets didn't have an opportunity to match the offer. It seems like there was no intention of matching the offer. It seems like if he would have come back to the Mets to match the offer after it seems like there was a report from weeks ago that they told him this is our number. Like you don't want to insult the guy who's one of the best players in the history of your organization. Like that would have been kind of, kind of, uh, kind of not that cool to use, you know what I mean? You know the word I'm trying to use. I can't say yes. it. Yes. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's very funny how like actual negotiations probably happened. And we, we learned about this a little bit too, as we talked with Omar a little bit later on this episode, which you guys will listen to. But it's so funny what people on the outside think happens in negotiations and how they actually go on. And people are like, well, the Mets didn't get to formally offer him one back. It's like, it's not really how it works. <laughs> it's not like I won't be the show where it's like, click, offer, submit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Keep moving on. Oh, he didn't take it. All right, whatever. The Rangers gave five for 185. What is your counter? Accept, decline, counter? It's like, no. It's Sim three days. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and sign Justin Verlander. <laughs> this stuff is always constantly in motion. And again, Justin Verlander, really, really good piece. And I want to make sure we kind of end this conversation with that is that Justin Verlander coming in is really, really good. American League Cy Young Award winner. We have two aces again at the top of our rotation. Two Hall of Famers, by the way, which is also really cool. Uh, It's going to be exciting. I think it hasn't hit a lot of Mets fans yet, but when Justin Verlander makes that first start at Citi Field, it's going to be like, we remember what it was like to see Max Scherzer. Verlander is going to be like that too. It's going to be incredible. Yep, and it's just the idea is the same as last one. You have your two aces, just get them to the end of the year, get to the dance, and anything could happen as we fill the rest of this team out. Yeah, keep getting more more and more depth on this roster, which we're definitely going to need because, as we know, uh, we couldn't even enjoy Justin Verlander signing with the Mets for too long because the Phillies had to come in and sign Trey Turner for 11 years, $300 million, which is just like, Oh my God! What like Trey Turner had forty million dollars? I think more apparently offered to him from the Padres, and he went to Philly. Philly, taxes. that city. Two things about one was taxes, California, as we just had the conversation with New York and Texas with Jacob Degrom, and two apparently Trey Turner's wife is from New Jersey, and you wanted to be in the East Coast. Interesting. And okay. he also has the relationship with Bryce Harper, dating back to their days together in Washington. And Kevin Long, I think they said too, and there was someone else in the Phillies organization that he was very friendly with uh yeah it sucks i really like trey turner but obviously mm-hmm. he's dead to me now uh I hate him now he's enemy number three or whatever put him on the long list of guys that i hate now but yeah he's a, he's a philly for the next 11 years lots of booze coming his way when he's at city field that's for sure trey turner might wind up as the best player ever who's never been the best player in his own team yeah that's honestly isn't that crazy to think about that is pretty crazy because he's lived in the shadow of Harper and Soto, Soto. and Mookie Betts. And, yeah. and yet he is one of the 10 best players in baseball, I think, conservatively. Easily, especially at the plate. And this contract, there was a lot of, again, a lot. Of, there was a lot of like LOL Metsing going on. A lot of people dunking, oh, my God, look, he only gets $27 million a year. There's, there's a big fundamental reason why Trey Turner is getting this length of a contract for such a relatively low AAV compared to what other players like that have. I guess there's two reasons, actually. One is because Trey Turner is already kind of in the process of being moved off of shortstop. He probably has two more years there of being even like average to above. Then after that, he's just going to be one of the best second basemen we've ever seen, which is great. <laughs> you could pay a second baseman like $30 million. So we see the Astros doing it. Altuve, and you can still field a very successful team. But two, this contract is running for trade turns. So he's 40 years old. Yeah. And that's a huge caveat. You look at the contract that the Mets signed for Francisco Lindor two years ago. And while the AAV is significantly higher, well, not significantly, it's like $6 million a year higher, $5.5 million a year higher. That contract cuts off when Lindor is 37 years old. From 38, 39, and 40 years old, Trey Turner is going to be making those $27 million a year, which I do think there is... I mean, again, that really doesn't matter at all. It's going to be inflation. You flax fly forever, win a ring, pay the guys whatever, not your money, yada, yada. But I think it is interesting that he was able to secure a contract and likely took less money up front so we could have more years on the back. Which is interesting. Definitely, definitely interesting. I mean, it's a good move for the Phillies. I still... I'm going to say it. I still don't fear them just because we handled them so well last year. They lined up so good. This makes them a little bit more, a little more. So I'm, I'm a little more aware of their existence now, but I'm going to be that. I'm going to be that guy. You're, people are going to clip this. I don't really care, but like the Phillies just don't scare me, even though they made it to the world series. They don't. Their lineup is so unbelievably good in that ballpark too. It's going to be it just in, in like a, in the playoff run, I don't want to run into them, but over a long season, like now with Trey Turner, it helps obviously a lot more. They're definitely way better now with Trey Turner. He makes a huge difference because they have a real short stop and can move stop to second, but I don't know. I just like, 
I'm not going to just give them the division by any means. No, I'm not going to give them division, but also it's like, as we learned last year, it doesn't even really matter. No, it doesn't matter at all, honestly. <laughs> There's been like tons of discourse that like, oh my God, this offseason, like the Mets have gotten worse and the Phillies have gotten better and the Braves are still better. Like there's no way they can compete. But it's like, that's not actually true because the Phillies won like 86, 87 games last year and then just got hot at the right time and went to the World Series. Think about it. The Mets won 15 more games than the Phillies last year. The Mets beat the Phillies head to head almost every single time they played them. Yet one of them went to the World Series and one of them did not. Like this kind of like judging of, of like value and like better or worse in the offseason is kind of like an irrelevant mental exercise because it doesn't really matter if we're better than us last year it just matters who we're better than next year no one can possibly know that yet and i think it's also funny too like think about the best team on paper every single year it's been the dodgers for the last few like astros have obviously been up there i don't think there's been any like surprises outside of like maybe a couple but really at the end of the day like it's not about being the best team on paper doesn't always win it's who plays the best throughout the season and at times you get cold at times you get hot it's about when you get hot not even throughout the season, just at the right part of the season, just being playing the best August, September, October. That's it. The Phillies <laughs> yeah, were no. awful last year until like the middle of June, and then they lost their best player, and Nick then they Plummer, got good. Nick Plummer saved their season. <laughs> there's like there's no rhyme or reason to this, and like every single Twitter GM is trying to be like, how are the Mets going to get better? If they don't get better, they're dead. And it's like, what? so you want next year they have to win 108 games, and then yeah. then you'll think they'll actually go further in the playoffs? Like that's not how any of this works. It's just like. Enjoy your free agency. Like you could be nervous about things because you want your team to get your guys. You don't want your team to lose their guys. And these other teams are getting better around you, it seems. But take it for what it is, because until the games are being played, none of it matters at all. Definitely, definitely. And I mean, it's a bit, it's a good division. It's a good division. It's going to be an absolute brawl. It's probably the best division in baseball. I think we can say that. Maybe either us or the AL East. If the Yankees ever sign any players, because now it seems yeah. like they're not going to. <laughs> no, because uh, as we've known, there's been some rumors going around about Aaron Judge, or as I should call him, Arson Judge, thanks to the sauce boss John Heyman himself for uh, tweeting out three times within a minute. Arson Judge appears to be going to the Giants. Aaron Judge appears to be going to the Giants. Psych! I was jumping the gun. No news yet. Bleacher Report took that opportunity to send a push notification. <laughs> that notification probably went to hundreds of thousands of people across the country, across the world. Like when that happened, like there was an entire conversation in my office about Aaron Judge. One of the Yankee fans was MFing him. He didn't want to win. I guess he's going to be a Kanoa and not a G. There all this crazy stuff. All the Yankee, some, some Yankee fans said, I'm going to boo him. I'm going to get rid of his jersey. <laughs> like these people were saying this in the five minutes, this news appeared to be legit. And I mean, we just live in a world where the only people we can trust are Jeff Passan and Carlos Baerga. <laughs> shout out carlos Baerga. shout out carlos Baerga. the dude had it no something like 18 hours before everybody and he was cash money no one believed him ourselves included and he was to the to the dollar amount he had it. 86.6 million on verlander yeah or, or bob nightingale he's the only man who can save us now is bob nightingale and also at the same time as this judge story broke with Heyman. There was a moment where an incredible piece of baseball journalism broke by Bradford William Davis and someone I've shouted out on the show multiple times, Dr. Meredith Willis, physicist. They basically spent the entire year gathering baseballs from every single ballpark, every single city in the country. And they studied every single one and they wrote down where they were taken from and the date they were taken from. And there's this incredibly expansive article that I didn't even get a chance to fully read yet because I just started it on the train. Then we immediately went to recording this. But basically that... MLB was using different balls in different places, different times of year, especially during the postseason. And for some reason, August, September at Yankee Stadium. Like, when did you know that? That For some reason, these balls were like a little bit juicier in August and September at Yankee Stadium. And I can't figure out why that possibly be. Yeah, well, what would be the reasoning that you would need to have juice balls at all the Yankees games specifically? I don't know. I can't think of one because I know that the home run record is 73 by Barry Bonds. So yeah. I don't know why you would have to juice the balls for Aaron Judge when he hit, what, 63? I think I think that was the ninth all time for a single season. I also I just I just really I have to I have no choice but to feel bad for Garrett Cole, who had an ERA over five at home after the All Star <laughs> break when Major League Baseball is pumping these balls into his home park. Who play the world's smallest violin ever for Garrett Cole and his thirty five million a year stinking it up at Yankee Stadium? Oh, that's so a real sorry, shame. Garrett. Over over a four ERA in the second half, and like when you know they were just completely screwing him over. <laughs> it also probably probably the pool holes balls were a little bit juiced too. Probably. I mean, I could imagine it wouldn't be it wouldn't be the worst idea. No, I mean... Albert Poole's the legend of the game. Aaron Judge is the guy with a good year. It's a guy who got a real 700. Yeah, believe it. <laughs> Deserved. Uh, now we're just uh, uh, now we're just dunking on Aaron Judge, but I mean, it, it, this has been a fun this has been a fun weekend. Finally, for the first time in years, it does feel like the stove is actually hot, and it's like hot in an organic way. Yes. Like it's scalding right now. We've got Josh Bell to the Guardians as well. There were a couple other... Andrew Heaney to the Rangers in a very affordable deal. 
they're Rangers putting together a little bit of a team over there. It's getting killed for my tweet saying that they could be a contender this year. <laughs> I mean, they can't. It's not. It's not crazy. The Rangers have like three pretty good hitters in that lineup. They have a very strong catcher's room. Possibly four really good hitters in that lineup. It depends on what you think about Elise Garcia and the. I think they have room in that rotation to probably bring a one more impact arm, and it looks like that even could happen. And if Jacob Degrom even throws 140 innings, John Gray throws 150 innings, and then Andrew Heaney throws 130 innings, like that's like a formidable one, two, three with room for one more. With room for one more, and they've got really, really good prospects who are getting closer and closer and closer. All it takes is one of those guys to hit, and you're like, oh, this lineup is scary now. Uh, yeah, Rangers, I think, are putting together a real good squad, especially like you don't hire Bruce Bochy and you don't spend all this money if you're not trying to win. Definitely. And last year, they hired the former Giants hitting coordinator, Donnie Ecker, to run their hitting development. And it kinda, you kind of saw it take place over the Rangers season where they were really bad for April and May. And then all yeah. of a sudden, it's like at the same moment, like Nathaniel Lowe, Marcus Simeon, Corey Seager, Jonah Heim all just clicked. And you're like, wow, this team could really kind of swing it a little bit. And I mean, there, there's room there to do some stuff. And they have a good team top to bottom. And that division is 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 okay. I mean, the Astros are incredible. The Mariners made the push, but like you can just walk all over the Angels and the A's. So, <laughs> especially three. Like and another thing that I think is kind of pushing this Rangers run to competitiveness is the new playoff format. It's really easy to make it. Yeah, you, you need 86, 87 wins to get there. Like, and you can sneak in as the third wild card team. And if you the same thing we were talking about the Mets last year. Now you just have Jacob Degrom healthy on October first. Like, why why not you? Why not us? Yep. No, definitely. I mean, the, the Phillies, the Phillies. Do we need any other proof? The Padres, like both of those teams made, made, made runs and they were not even close to the best teams in their league. But yeah, I mean, the one thing I'm really scared about with the Rangers too is they kind of have, I don't want to say a hole in center field, but they have some holes in the outfield. And there's definitely one guy that I want the Mets to bring in, which is Brandon Nimmo, who could fit in a lot of teams. And it seems like he is going to be really expensive. It's going to be a bidding war, especially now with Bellinger off the market, signing with the Cubs on a one-year deal. It seems like this Nimmo market is getting a little bit out of control because we, I mean, we I, we feel we feel a little bit more plugged in. Than I think we ever have been in our lives, kind of hilariously, <laughs> almost kind of by accident. We've just heard a lot of people saying that like teams are connected to Brandon Nimmo, and it's like, is every team like with money connected to Brandon Nimmo right now? It's kind of an it's kind of a scary place for us to be as Mets fans, but it's like it's a little bit vindicating being like everyone wants our guy because our guy's really really good. Yeah, no, he's he's going to be a hot, hot commodity on the market, especially with that defense and the, how good he is at the plate. I mean, he's one of the better center fielders in baseball. He's not Mike Trout, but he's one of the better ones. All right, prediction. How many years and how much money does Brandon Nimmo sign for? I'm not going to ask you the team. Okay, how old is Brandon Nimmo? He's 30? I think he's 29, actually. Okay, I think this is going to be a... What did Springer get? He got like six, seven years, was it? Brandon Nimmo is 29 years old, and George Springer's contract is. I love. I love I good podcasting. I think it's really going to be similar to whatever Springer got. It might be like a year six more. for 150. Okay, so I'm going to go seven for 175. You think you'll get seven? I guess Springer was. I think already 31 when that contract was signed. Just he was 31 the, when it was signed. It's not necessarily that I think I don't want to even like that. Brandon Nimmo is like worth that money necessarily, but I think there's just going to be such a bidding war that someone's going to have to make that jump to really stand out and i think someone will do it i mean at the mets need them the yankees could use them the rangers could use them if the giants don't get aaron judge or if they do get aaron judge they could use them the red sox could use them every single team in baseball outside of nobody I, is there anybody that couldn't use him no i mean i don't know the astros could use him the angels could use him um i guess the, <laughs> the phillies could really use him mariners could use him That'd i mean be great to be great in seattle my god yeah. Every single team in baseball could use Brandon Nimmo because if you're not going to, let's say you have your center fielder like a Julio Rodriguez. Oh no, you put Brandon Nimmo on left and right and he's still elite. Oh, what are you going to do? It's just, it, it could really go anywhere. And this is getting out of control. Also, because there's, it's so hard to get a center fielder. Like the second best center fielder in the market right now is Kevin Guillermoire. It was coming off a year where he like had like a bum hip and you couldn't even play defense anymore. <laughs> it's like, is this really the guy? Like you're going to be stuck with like a Gilmore, whoever doesn't get Brandon Nimmo, who like actually has a hole there, might be stuck with like a Guillermo Heredia. Like play, yeah. a player like that, like a full on just defensive replacement. You figure out the rest or the trade market for Brian Reynolds really heats up, even though the Pirates have said that they were un, unlikely to move him. And this, this is not that many options in center field as we as Mets fans have known that over the last seven years. People have wanted to find a center fielder when really you had one in your nose the whole yeah. time. Yep. And Nimmo is a Boris guy. So we know that this is not going to it's not going to go quickly in the night. This thing's going to be dragged out, dragged out to make sure he gets even one dollar extra on what his contract than what it should be. That is the worst part too. Like at least, and we were able to kind of see this writing on the wall that like Degrom was going to sign quickly. He's that kind of guy, and then immediately we're able to pivot and get Verlander to get the pit out of everybody's stomachs. Thank God before the work week. 
And now it's just going to go on and on and on. So it does kind of make me think that there is a chance that the Mets do attack the pitching market still again before the end of this Nimmo, this Nimmo saga, I'm going to call, comes to an end. Yeah, a lot of rumors of Jameson Tyone, a guy who we've talked about a lot, specifically you on this podcast, who I'm getting more and more hip to as you, you talk more about it. Looks like he could just be like a Chris Bassett light, younger version kind of thing. He looks very solid. Uh, a lot of good pitching available still for sure. Yeah, Kodai Sanga's another name has been connected to the Mets a lot. His agent, though, came out today with the big power play, said multiple teams have offered this five-year contracts. So it's a good move. It's, a yeah, it's a really move. good move. It's a good move. He knows he knows what he's holding right now, which you got, you got, I mean, you got to get respect for that. And the only thing is, though, that the Heaney contract really seems like it might have dampered the market for some of these guys who are a little bit less reliable, have thrown less innings over the last few years, because Heaney's a guy who there was a lot of excitement about earlier in the offseason. He had the second highest strikeout to walk ratio last year in all of baseball, only behind Spencer Strider. I mean, again, you only do like 90 innings, so then you have to take that what you take. And now he basically got the same amount of money as like Matt Boyd, who also got the same amount of money as Mike Clevenger. That whole glut doesn't make any sense to me. And the fact no. it doesn't make any sense, it means to, that the Mets should sign like as many of those guys as possible now. 100%. Yeah, no, I think I think the pitching market, uh, Andrew Heaney, a lot of his money too is going to be incentive-based. I don't know if you saw that. Mm-hmm. $25 million over the two years, basically. But it can go up to $37 million based on incentives and performance, which that's huge. That's huge. That could change everything. We got a breaking news tweet from Kike Hernandez. Oh, what's Kike got for us? He said, ah, the never-ending race to be first with the laughing emoji. Hashtag nice. arsony. I mean, listen, when we talked to Tomas Nito this year uh, and we interviewed him, we brought up the uh, the Boob Nightingale tweet. So we know that these players are, are locked in, too. It's not just the fans at home. The players are like, who's going to be on my team next year? I'd love to know. And everyone's on Twitter. I mean, Twitter's fun. And I think, honestly, for the rumors, is there anything else? I don't know what's been cooking on Twitter the last 45 minutes or so that we've been recording this, but I got to assume that John Heyman's put out a couple tweets that aren't true. No, I mean, the big <laughs> thing going around more so seems like it's um, it's uh, this, this Bradford William Davis article with uh, Dr. Mary Willis about the baseballs. It seems like that is kind of hilarious that like that is now what people are talking about more so with Aaron Judge. Like that one tweet that you guys I'm sure have probably seen by now with the graphs of where these, yeah, it's these like these middle juice baseballs were because mostly we're using dead balls all year as you guys can remember. There was a smattering of the old juicy balls and then there what uh, uh, Brad, William Bradford Davis and Meredith Willis were calling Goldilocks balls because they were not too hot, not too cold, which that was actually kind of funny. But they were closer to being juiced than dead. And the, and like there's a chart that says, oh, the Yankees have all of them. So it's kind of fun. You guys probably see that. It's good. It's good Twitter humor right now. Just pulled an Adam Schefter on you guys. If you're watching the YouTube video version of this, I was just checking my phone during mid podcast. But hey, news never stops. We got to keep on the grind here. See what's, you know, passing tweeting. Uh, I think we wanted to bring in John, though. John had a little bit of something for us, too, before we wrap up this episode. So, John. Not wrap it up. Send it to Omar. That's true. Send to Omar. That's a good point. John, how are you feeling? What's up? What's up, guys? Yeah, I mean, I've been looking forward to uh, to getting with you guys all week, really, since Friday night and the news broke. Um, and you guys touched on it before. When push comes to shove with the entire situation, The New York Mets as a franchise, especially after the acquisition of Justin Verlander, are likely in a better position for 2023 than they would have been if Jacob deGrom was brought back, especially on a five-year deal. Now, let me say this. I love the fact that the Texas Rangers are trying. Yes. That's massive. And, you know, we talked throughout the week, and we're trying to cook up different ideas. Oh, you know, this, this could be a good trade target. That could be a good trade target. And when you really think about it, there aren't that many teams as of right now on December 6th who you can pinpoint and say, this team doesn't have a chance to make it. This team isn't competing in 2023. And, you know, the Dodgers have dominated the NL West for a long time. I think you can make the argument the Astros have dominated their division more. It's just been completely non-competitive, completely non-competitive. And that used to be a pretty good rivalry between the Rangers and the Astros. And it's good to see more teams wanting to win and and going the extra effort. So even though the Jacob deGrom contract in a vacuum might be a little bit nuts, five years with a six-year vesting option, good for Texas, good for the Rangers, and we need to see more of that in baseball. Now, obviously, from the Mets perspective and the Met fan perspective, it's a bittersweet, as you guys mentioned. You, that's the word you used. It's it's the end of an era. Yeah. And that's always sad. You know, I'll never forget where I was when Jacob DeGrom made his Major League debut. I was driving back from college for the summer. And I'm listening on the radio. And Rafael Montero was the guy 
Yep. And they made their debuts on back to back nights. Were you going to say something, James? Uh, that was Subway Series weekend, and my dad yes, and I was. wanted to go to one of the games. And I told a story in this podcast before. He's like, all right, pick one of the games. We'll go. Two guys making their debut. The Mets team was terrible. And he was like, let's see something exciting. And I was like, oh, let's go see Montero. He's a higher-ranked prospect. I don't know <laughs> yeah. who this guy is pitching tomorrow. And then I watched Masahiro Tanaka throw a complete game shutout on Friday night. Both guys got paid this offseason, just a little bit differently. Yeah. <laughs> that is a good point. They actually both did get paid. Big offseasons for both of them. But, you know, there's so many great memories with Jake. Um, we were talking before about some of his best performances. The one hitter in Philly where Zach Eflin has the one hit. Um, 2021 in, in April against the Nationals when the Mets wore the Jackie Robinson jerseys. He strikes out a career high 15 batters. Cold that was night. In, very cold night. That was incredible. Um, obviously, hearing Simple Man for the first time this year when he returned, that was fantastic as well. But... I went and I looked at some numbers, just comparing the two of them, DeGrom and Verlander, in recent seasons. Now, Justin Verlander in 2020 made one start. He got hurt. He has Tommy John. He doesn't pitch the entire 2021 season. But if you go from 2020 through this past season, Jacob DeGrom threw 224 in the third innings. Justin Verlander threw 181 innings, and most of that came this year. Dominant 175 innings pitched. And the immediate gut reaction from a lot of Mets fans, and again, I get it. It was emotion. You know, this was a guy who a lot of people wanted to see be a lifelong Met. And number 48 is enshrined forever. And it still might be. You know, I think we can all agree. Jacob DeGrom may be deserving of having his day. James is making a face. So it's a good debate, at least. If I could just say peace quickly. I think that if if you don't, retire with the team or win a championship it's hard to get that jersey retired i'm w- I'm with you i think his play was good enough i don't think it's a detriment to the the numbers that he put up or the legacy that he left with the for Mets, sure but it will feel a little bit weird that he left on his own choice to then retire yeah. his number like that that happens and at times but like didn't win a championship yeah, like if he that's if, the there, big one. if there was a if there was another flag that was up there in, in part because of jacob Degrom, i said like yeah for sure mets lore forever and he is will be mets lore forever but i think it's i think it's a little bit different sure and you know time heals all heals all wounds and i think that i think what he does in texas is going to shape the perception of how we look at jacob de you know if he goes and wins two more cy youngs it's gonna hurt more <laughs> yeah. it's gonna hurt more But if he continues as he was in 2021 and 2022, where he was dominant for the first half of 2021, and then he makes his last start on July 7th, doesn't pitch again, has the entire offseason to get healthy, makes two or three spring training starts, the last of which was that Scherzer to Grom back-to-back start against the Cardinals in March, where we're all like, wow, this is amazing. Don't make me relive this, John. Don't make me relive this. And then it's... it also just goes on to say like the the fears about what this Mets team will look like last year. And then you look at this past year and you won 100 games and those two guys, Scherzer and DeGrom, combined for what, 200 innings? A hair, <laughs> a shade below 200 innings? So it's like sure. we, we really don't know. that like We can project this to hell, but it's like almost impossible to kind of forecast. Sure. Um, uh, Joel Sherman wrote a piece. He actually interviewed Brent Strom, who was Justin Verlander's pitching coach from 2017 through 2021. Legend. In, in Houston. Um, And it was a great idea to talk to him because who knows this guy better than Brent Strom. And when Justin Verlander got to Houston, people thought his career was kind of coming to an end at that point. He was struggling in Detroit and he kind of reinvented himself. And, you know, my big takeaways from that, that interview were this guy's built differently. You know, this guy wants to continue to learn and evolve. He's driven like none other. You know, the, the word Tom Brady has been thrown out in comparison to Justin Verlander, the way that he just takes incredible care of himself. And also the two years that he took off very well might make this guy maybe 40 in age come February, but the arm might not be a 40 year old arm. Yeah. And that's another exciting part about this. So there's going to be plenty excuse me, plenty of time to reminisce about all the great memories with Jacob DeGrom. And there are so, so many. But for the right now, this franchise is in a better spot, especially in the one, two parts of their rotation. And I don't see how any Met fan 
other than letting the emotions, and I understand them, I do. But look, in a weird way, when Derek Jeter hung him up, it was emotional because I was like, I've watched this guy dominate for the wrong team, in my opinion. My dominate entire <laughs> my no, my entire adult life. Dominate's and, not the word. Compile. Okay, sure, compile, <laughs> but still be part of a dominant team. Yes, yes. For my entire adult life. And it's all I knew. You know, from 96, my first Met game was 97. That's kind of when I actually got into watching baseball. Damn, you're old. Thank you. <laughs> I don't remember Tom Seaver. Uh, <laughs> but that was weird for me because that was a situation where it was like, wow, this is truly the closing of a chapter and the end of an era. So I, I understand all of that. But in the right now, this this team, this rotation... They're in a better spot than they were seven days ago. And that's all there is to it. And I'll say one more thing. Trey Turner going to the Phillies. Braves, Phillies, Mets. The rivalry in the NL East is going to be and fuego. I think Wayne Randazzo tweeted about that. The Mets and Phillies haven't had a true, true rivalry since the 07 08 uh, situations, if you would. I guess last year there was this kind year of one. Felt, it felt like it. And also two years ago with the Alvarado stuff. It, like, I think it's been a rivalry, but it hasn't. there hasn't been, I feel like, a lot of back and forth of meaningful games. I think that's more so where it comes down to is like there hasn't been that many close, meaningful games. And the shame is that they just messed up the schedule this year. We're not going to get to play each other that much and actually oh. to settle this on the field. We're going to have to settle yeah. this all against the Royals and the Twins and the yeah, Rockies. So soapbox, old man. It's Better true, than- though. I mean, this is the best year I want to play these teams. Like, we have these rivalries, these longstanding traditional rivalries with these teams, more traditional with the Phillies and the Braves. But in our lifetimes, the Braves, from what I've seen in baseball, is the Mets and Braves are one of the traditional rivalries in the league. And it just sucks that now baseball all three, these are regional. three, these are legit three of the seven best teams in all baseball. Or at least track, trending towards be, being that way. And we the can't region, play each other. The regionality of baseball is what has held it back. You need to make this a more national game. And That's the right. way That's... to do that is to play all the teams. I right. know nobody wants to hear it because I agree with you. It does hurt the rivalry a little bit. There's no doubt. But let's be honest. Johnny in Los Angeles, who's fallen in love with baseball, doesn't really care too much about the Mets-Phillies rivalry. He wants to see his Dodgers or his Angels play the Mets instead of. You know. Sure, but that's what the NBA did, and now that league is completely devoid of emotion whatsoever. It's just an Instagramable product. That's because they shoot threes only. It's no longer cool. That's yeah, you're right. Cool. The, M- the M- base- baseball doesn't have an outcome problem with uh, you know, with, with strikeouts, walks, and home runs. Home runs you're so are right. Cool. Home runs but, are cool. do you, but do you guys think that, in a way, on the opposite end of that argument, that because they're not playing 18 times a game, each game carries a little bit more weight? Like, that's true. I hope yep. no one gets upset at me about this. Only college football reference I'll make. Ohio State and Michigan, they only play once a year. And maybe they'll play again in the uh, in the final here. But that is what makes that rivalry so special, is that you get it once a year and that is it. And maybe only playing the Phillies, what is it, nine times now? I got to close my door because the TV's out. The TV's on and Vito's yelling at me. <laughs> Give me one second. Johnny podcasts over here. John John's on a seven minute diatribe and his background noise the whole time. <laughs> Sorry about that, V. Um, if it is nine games a year, every time these two teams take the field against each other, every pitch, every ninety feet, it's going to be like playoff baseball. Yeah, and maybe that that enhances those games. You know, you don't get to see them over and over where you have five game series against the Braves and you go to Atlanta for a four game series against the Braves. I think that in a way, like, yes, Mark, I, I totally agree with you. It's not right that Mets fans haven't seen Shohei Otani at City Field once since he came over. Yeah. You know, Mike Trout is not marketed enough, maybe, whatever the right term is. I think he's marketed enough, but he's not he's not seen all over the place. That is a problem, and, and we can fix that by doing the way that the schedule is going to be, but also not overdoing it, oversaturating Sure. where you have to play every team in your division 18 times because when you're playing the Nationals 18 times, Sucks. it's Feels good. Who, yeah, but it's also whoever loses the least amount of games to those fourth and fifth place teams in your division, that's how you win the division. So, you know, I, I kind of do like the balance schedule a little more and it's just going to be, it's going to be an incredible, incredible race. It really is. Yeah. I'm so excited. All of these games, it, it's going to be a war. It's going to be a battle. 
be even better if the Mets bring back Brandon Nimmo. Then it'll be even a better race. <laughs> Closing statements before we move on to Omar. I want to get your guys' take on this. Well, first, a point, just that it does seem like that. I think Mets fans would have been totally cool if we would if we would have signed Justin Verlander on Friday night and the Rangers would have signed Jacob DeGrom on Monday night. I think that was like the biggest key to like get people angry. And I think that's just kind of funny when you look at it. Like pretend they happen at the exact same moment. No one really cared that much. Yeah. How many starts do you guys think Jacob DeGrom will make in a Texas Rangers uniform? Over He's 34 years, years old right now, turning years. 35, and he basically has a six-year contract. The maximum many... starts pitchers usually make in the season is around 32. How gonna many say... starts will Jacob DeGrom make in six years? I'm going to say 110. That's so many. I think he's going to make 110. I don't know. Like, I that's like, that's like 20 a year, a little under. Yeah, and I think there's going to be it's a like couple years a year. where he's going to be fully healthy. Like, I, I, I believe it. I don't know. Same thing. You're healthy until you're not, or you're injury prone until you're not. Whatever you're saying is James. I don't know. I, th- I think Degrom's going to be all right. Uh, I again, like, I just, I can't come from a place where I even want him to make less starts because I, I hope he does great in, in Texas. I really have no bad feelings towards him. I'm going to root for him. Hope he does great. Just when you pitch against the Mets, pitch like crap. That's all I ask <laughs> yeah. for. No, not disparaging the guy whatsoever, but just like after the last two years, like being realistic. I want to hear your answer, John, because you're a little more shrewd than Mark. <laughs> Whoa, hey, <laughs> shrewd he is. Look, I my my biggest thing with Degrom was that after he made his final start of the 2021 season, which was before the All Star break, he didn't come back. He had the entire off season to get healthy. And we don't know how much throwing he did because the lockout and things were quiet. A couple spring training starts later, right before the season starts, we hear that he has his shoulder scalpula injury and that it was going to keep him out for, you know, at, at that time, it sounded like June. And then it wound up being August. So he went over a full year without pitching. Longest amount of time on the injured list ever for a player who did not get surgery. Yeah, that's. See that that's just that's going to drop my answer by five starts. <laughs> um, I, I'm going to say over what five or six because the six is not guaranteed. Well, the six is not guaranteed, but all he needs to do to get the sixth year is get one top five Cy Young finish or throw 625 innings in five years. Okay, so that so that's he hits, doable. He hits it in mine, yeah. Okay, yeah, so yours so, is definitely hits it and gets the six. I mean, but I guess that really, or it's just get a top five Cy Young finish or throw 160 innings in the fifth year of this deal. Or be quote unquote healthy, which is a contract language. <laughs> yeah, I, I would say eighty to ninety. Um, you know, Texas could also implement a six man rotation, which when you are spending top dollar on top talent, and I think this goes for a lot of teams. Either you have six guys that can start, or every sixth day you have a guy like a Ryan Yarbrough, who I know I love to talk about, <laughs> or a Trevor Williams, or a Noah Syndergaard. One of those guys who can give you, pitchers. who can get nine outs for you, and then you piece it together the rest of the way, and you take, you take a little bit of strain off of everyone else in the rotation. Now maybe that enables you, if you're only pitching every six days, not five days, to go a little bit deeper into games. Um, but the other thing about Degrom is that, and I know you're talking starts, and I'm now kind of talking innings pitched. Even when he came back this season, there are two starts that really, really st- stood out to me as, uh, and I know that no one really wanted to acknowledge it at the time because you're hopeful. We know how good he can be when everything is right. But the first one is the Oakland start. Yeah. The night after the Braves lose to the Phillies and the Mets have a chance to, I think, take a three game lead in the division. They take a three nothing lead in the first inning. He gives it back. And we really had not seen that from Jacob DeGrom since it was almost like his start in Texas when Terry Collins was consoling him in the dugout. The second start was um, was against the Pirates. It was the day of the Jets comeback against the Browns. I think it was September 18th Mm -hmm. where he dominated through five. Gets into the sixth, doesn't record an out. The Mets are winning the game three nothing. And O'Neill Cruz hits the three run home run. And for me, that was like. Uh, to get through the lineup twice was no problem. But the third time, all of a sudden the wheels fell off and that kind of became a trend with him. So, you know, maybe he is a six inning guy now. Maybe, maybe that's what he is. And that's okay. If you're going to dominate six innings, strike out nine, walk none or one, 
allow a couple of hits, like that's obviously great. Kind of like Verlander last year. Kind of like Verlander last year. But is that worth the average over the contract of 37 million? A couple of years, it's 40. I don't know. I don't feel as good about him in the long term. I told you guys, you guys know I felt that way before any of this yeah. happened. You know, it's just, it's the bigger gamble. And, you know, I don't like taking gambles, especially when it's $185 million. That's a lot to gamble. So what about Only you, Chris James? Kreider. I mean, I... I Kreider if scored would... last night, by the way. Nice shirt, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> if if we had to put these contracts next to each other, I think there's no doubt at all that I would take Justin Verlanders. I, I mean, I said it before. It's like, he's a guy who's going to be more stable. He's going to be in the rotation possibly more often. And... He just like some. It's like when pitchers kind of put themselves in that freak of nature range. I took that terminology from Matt Eddy, Baseball America, friend of the show. You almost just want them more, and nothing else really matters. It's like you see the Verlander, the Scherzer, even like the Wainwright, the Darvish. I guess you can even put them in that category at this point. The Cole, how many innings he's had in the last few years? Like you have to kind of block out every other thing because it's like this guy. It's just different. You can't really interpret him and his talent and his ability and his durability like you would other pitchers in baseball, and that makes them so much more. Um, attractive to a team signing. And Jake Jake DeGrom, it seemed like he had that for a little while, but you can't really ignore what's happened health-wise these last three years, especially when it's just there's no real guarantee it's going to get better. Nothing was actually ever surgically repaired. That's it. And these these vesting options, if he misses one complete season, then that that six-year option becomes very unguaranteed because Mm -hmm. then let's say it's four years to hit 625 innings. That's not that easy for a guy who's barely pitched in two years. It's not. What's What's your number then? What's your number? I didn't My give number? a number either. Yeah. Yeah, give your numbers. I'm the only one who gave a number out of here. I mean, I would say total starts. I'll give it I'll give it five years because I'm anticipating he does miss a big chunk of one. I would say probably like 82. I was gonna say 87. This could be a great estimate for five years down the road. Well, we'll huge, we'll huge the penalty. Guy. When we're celebrating John's 40th birthday. <laughs> we'll, we'll reminisce about this one and whoever loses has to buy drinks for everybody wherever we're at oh i'll be God, too old yeah. to drink by then <laughs> i mean the hangovers are already unbearable and i'm only 31 yeah. you guys have a lot to look forward to in that yeah, by right. the way big shout out to Vito for these new microphones yes. yes able to pick up the tv in the other room just incredible orchestration these are great quality production now i got us uh, some sirens we got, sirens. We, got we, we got hands free now we can actually talk and type and do whatever we want to do shout out vito for these wonderful pieces of technology Fantastic. i don't yeah, want john to think that thanking me excuses the tv on in the background <laughs> i feel like that was a very targeted thank you uh i sent john 12 texts like john your tv john your tv please i'm dying right now but i well, appreciate the, i know. appreciate the acknowledgement john but i think it was a little underhanded I think no, I think no, no. I I did not see your messages until I saw the purple, and I was like, "Oh crap!" I I got up to close it. I could have just been like, "Ah, oh, I didn't see them." I'm These sorry. These mics Vito. are so good. These mics are so good. We could do an ASMR episode one day. Oh, I would love that. Uh, another Carlos Baerga is taking another shot. Let's hear it. <laughs> A source from San Francisco. This per Carlos Baerga's Instagram account. Oh, so no. absolutely not verified source. A source from San Francisco who is in meetings in San Diego. Let us know the signing of Aaron Judge between today and tomorrow. The team could also sign Carlos Correa. Whoa, that'd be crazy. But getting both of them. That's a Baerga. That, that that is per Baerga, who's one for one. One for. I think he actually got one last year too. Oh, he's gotten he a couple. He's gotten a couple. Yeah. I have a hot take. As a Yankee hater, I told you guys this. I almost want them to retain him. At, at an absurd price, at an absurd, like go to a level that just doesn't even make sense because that team has a lot of other holes to fill. I know they signed Tommy Canely today, but like the Yankees would be better off signing, let's say Carlos Rodon and maybe a shortstop, no a, a Dansby. But if they can no shot, two, 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 no, two guys will never sign. <laughs> why do you say that? I mean, just Rodon does not seem like a guy who's very willing to come to New York. So you have to really break the bank for him. And the Yankees aren't don't seem like to me the modern Yankees the type of team that would commit like seventy five million dollars to two pitchers. They definitely won't pay him more than Garrett Cole because Garrett Cole will cry if he's not the highest paid pitcher on his own staff. And sure. the only reason I don't agree with that is because there's not that many whole fillable guys left in the market besides shortstops who the Yankees have already shown unwilling to sign the last couple of years when more elite shortstops have been in the market. And yeah, also, the Yankees they miss out on Aaron Judge. Play. Yeah, of course, Andy Volpe and As- Oswald Peraza are going to be two of the best players in the league. Of course, that's why they were <laughs> that's why they were such prominent members of their playoff roster. But 
there's not that many guys on the market right now for a Yankees team that was struggling with to find offensive firepower last year to really bring in and actually make a difference. So if they miss out on Aaron Judge, I'm just kind of rooting for them to be the Moneyball Yankees. Leads us to a perfect time here to go ahead and talk about Omar Minaya, who we got a chance to speak with, talk about the winter meetings. All this stuff did happen before Justin Verlander, DeGrom, all the big news is happening. So just keep that in mind when you are listening. But it's really insightful to get some information from him, see what it's like from a guy who's actually been at the winter meetings, making moves, making deals. Mets GM, former guy. We have a bunch of content coming out with him next year in the 2023 calendar year. So keep an eye out for that. And uh, can't, can't wait for you guys to listen to this. Omar's the man. And also just as as we've like made our jokes and had our fun a little bit here, talk about Justin Verlander. I think it's I I think I'm speaking for all three of us right now. We're still in the room saying that there's a special place in my heart for Jacob deGrom. For sure. I'll never forget watching a pitch. Like I'll never forget the All-Star game. I think that was twenty well, twenty thirteen though was twenty no, twenty fifteen the All Star game at City yep. Field. The simple man this year that started against the Phillies that John talked about before, the near no hither. So many callous memories. The wild card game this year where he shut down the Padres. Jacob DeGrom is one of the best Met players that any of us have ever seen on, on the New York Mets, and we should all appreciate what we just were able to experience with him. Yeah, definitely best wishes for DeGrom in Texas. Like I said, rooting for the guy. Rooting for the guy, and then once he comes to City Field, standing O, hope you stink against us. That's what I'm hoping for. Oh, before we go, are they playing simple man, you think, when he comes back? Yes. I think I, he deserves it. I think you give him one. I don't know if it's fair for me to comment on that. So Yeah, John might have inside information. <laughs> John might be making the call. <laughs> all right. Perfect time for us to go to Omar. Let's do it. All right, guys. So here we are with Omar Minaya. Thank you for joining us. We've been talking to you for quite a bit now, and you guys will see that content a little bit later this offseason. A lot of amazing stories from Omar. Can't wait for you to hear about them. But we thought it would be a great time to talk about stuff that's going on in current baseball, with the Mets specifically, because this offseason in general – feels like a really, really important one for the Mets. And you've been a part you know, of the Mets organization as a GM and finding and building those teams and making them into contenders like the Mets are currently trying to do. And we'd love to pick your brain about it a little bit. Now, the thing about it is that every day goes by and then it kind of seems to be build up to the winter meeting. Yeah. And then once you bring everybody into a room in the winter meeting, for some reason, deals just get done. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what happens in the winter meeting. And you as a fan are saying, come on, man, let's get this done. And then the teams, but it just builds up to the quote-unquote famous baseball winter meetings. I wanted to ask about the winter meetings because they're happening later this week. It's going to be the first in-person winter meeting since 2019. What's that like going to the, into that winter meetings as a GM, especially of a winning team, a team that people are looking at, people are circling, people know you're ready to make moves? How do you, how do you approach that kind of situation? You work. and You approach it, you know, first of all, it's good to know that you have support from your owners, that your owners are going to be investing, that you have, you know, there might be winter meetings. There are some teams that they're not having no meetings with agents. <laughs> okay? <laughs> you can name a few teams because probably. There's probably. No, because that's the reality is the agents are not even returning your call. Yeah. They say, what do you want to talk to us about? <laughs> like, you know, there are certain players that you probably, some teams went to meetings on the minor league, uh, uh, the Rule 5 draft. That's their, yeah, that's yeah. their winter a, meeting. That's how it starts. <laughs> that being said, you feel like you you're going there, you're going, the word, you put in all the work, the season is over, and really if you really work, you know, as an organization, you have a system in place, you already started putting in the work in September, and, and even before that, you already have a lot of phone calls, you, your goal is to go there, prepare, probably just talking to who you're going to talk to, other teams, agents, you know, you probably have a, teams have a board, you have your staff, and you go back and forth, and uh you know, each team is different. Uh, sometimes you go from team to teams uh, and talk in their room. Everybody's different. Uh, and the winter meetings are, are kind of a, it really is a, it's a convention of ideas. I was just about That's to say. It's a baseball convention. And you think of it that way and you enjoy yourself. I like to believe that you go there, you work hard, you have fun, enjoy yourself. Try to be productive. What is that? For? And understand that the thing, the key thing is there is pressure. Yeah. There is pressure because as deals are being done and guys are being taken off the ta off the board, you have a pressure. And then, especially if you are the general manager of the New York Mets, and you have a great, you know, in New York, you have a lot of attention. Baseball is the thing. Everything's being talked about. Yep. Uh, and then, of course, depending on where they are, there are certain just some places in the general in the winter meetings that, are like, you know, Nashville is like, you know, usually they used to do it uh, in Nashville, which is kind of. I mean, some of these hotels can be very complicated. It's like Vegas <laughs> East, right? Like uh, it's like Vegas East. Well, it's, <laughs> it, Nashville is like, because you got uh, some of those places, you have tourists. 
Yeah. So yeah. in the middle of baseball, there's a lot of like different tourists. <laughs> uh, it's going to be in San Diego this year. Yeah. And you listen, San Diego is the best. It's the awesome. Best. You we can't love be it. there. You can't <laughs> go wrong in San Diego. Team, eh. But uh, <laughs> it's preparation, hard work. I believe in fun, laughs, and uh, and then it's really you know it's all cramped in together for about seventy two to forty uh, seventy two hours. About is there any fraternizing with like the enemy? Like do you ever do you, ever, do you hang out with the other general? Oh managers? yeah, I mean I, I mean me personally. When you did, I did. Oh yeah, so I mean so no, there was yeah. a, oh yeah no, there was just a lot of fun. You know, it's a lot of. <laughs> You know, you kind of, you know, you go to dinner sometimes. I, I everybody's different. I'm saying, I yeah, mean, of course. But, you know, you know, I, I've been always uh, friends with different guys. There's yeah. some general managers that you're more uh, friendlier than with. Yeah. You know, some guys like to drink uh, um, <laughs> um, Starbucks and cappuccino at 12 o'clock, and other guys like to drink wine. So <laughs> I don't know. Some guys like to drink beer. Whatever you want to do. <laughs> but I believe you have to kind of work hard, have fun. Go to dinner, and it really is a good time for your staff, you know. It has changed. The winter meeting has changed now. You know, in the past, it was run by the National Association. That's not no more. Okay. And there was a great time to kind of talk to your minor league, uh, the teams, like the president from the uh, A-League, double-A, triple-A teams that you have. You have will go to, you know, bring those guys. I love that part. That has been somewhat reduced. Um, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work, but it's a lot of fun. And if you know, it's kind of it's almost also rewarding a lot of the people in the office to go there and, and making me a. I'm a I'm a big believer in making everybody feel a part of that of the organization. What does the actual setup look like? Because all I can imagine in my head is like a big long hallway with doors, and it says, has like the team's name like next to it. They like knock on the door. Like I'd no, like to speak the, with the Mets. No, that does not happen. <laughs> that does not happen. Okay. What does it look like? It's like any <laughs> hotel room, and it's uh, you know. Uh, there is some. There are some privacy issues, some some security issues for you to go upstairs. So the average fan can I just kind of go upstairs. You will need to need a pass. A cup in the to door. That. <laughs> oh, there's been uh, some. I hear some people that kind of sneaking in trying to listen to that. Uh, I don't encourage that, but I've heard those rumors that people are kind of. What are we hearing next door? You know, but it's really set up. There's a, you know, usually the general manager has his room, okay, or his suite. And then next to his room, or let's say his bedroom, is in a suite. You have a big suite, and it's usually a lot of, like, you know, pretzels, a whole bunch of bunchies <laughs> around, you know what I'm saying? Um, bunchies, no drinking, you know, that at least that I know of. But yeah. in the old days, there used to be a lot of drinking, but not no more. <laughs> now they have cappuccino and cold pizza. I sharp. am not the cold pizza type of guy. I don't no? Know, no. No, 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 no. I wish I could eat no. cold pizza. I'm a cold pizza? Lactose intolerant, like, in oh, the last few years, no, so no, 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 no cheese no, pizza No anymore. way. There are some guys, you know, and then, of course, it's some, you, know, you, you have some real young GMs and all the GMs, uh, you know, it's just kind of, um, it's a fraternity in its own way. Mm. Uh, now, the thing now is that you, GMs don't stay around for long. It's kind of yeah. different. Yeah. So it's a little different. And probably have much bigger staffs. So it's probably a lot more, a lot more people. Much, much bigger staff. Spaces. Much, much bigger staffs now. You know, you have, you know, between a combination of the the, the, the analytics department and, you know, it's, but it's fun. It's, it's you know, it's just everybody kind of coming together. And I, I love it. I think that it's, it's good for the organization when people come together. Do you think the winter meeting is a better place to make a trade or sign a free agent? Ooh, mm, good question. I like that. I think... It's more to sign a free agent okay. because the free agency world works this way. It's like a domino. Once yeah. one guy yeah. goes off the board, then you start kind of like, okay, let me let me. Get. Usually, agents wait for that guy to go off the board. Yeah. Either two things are going to happen. Okay, I'm going to stick to my what I want or take a year less. Yeah. <laughs> or I'm going to if you're a team, listen, I'm going to have to give him that extra year. Yeah. And I remember, I think it happened uh, with Pedro when we went out to Pedro that year. You know, we were at three at the end. It, it, I don't think that trade hap- that deal might have been done in the winter meetings. But that's when, you know, and agents know that. Agents know that if you're at three, you're, you know, winter meeting, once the, that guy goes off the board. Yeah. Let's just say he, this year, you know, Verlander. I mean, Rowan, it just happened to Brayu. He just got the extra year, allegedly. That's it. And we yeah. weren't even at the winter meetings. Yeah. yeah. And, and that's. And they don't that, even have a GM. That, <laughs> well, but that's just. That's just well, you know, that's yeah. a team that knows what they want, yeah. Yeah. and they're going to be aggressive. They're not going to wait till the winter meeting. And I and I'm one to believe. I, I you know I don't need to wait till the winter meeting. I know if you know what I want, I'm going to try to get it. Definitely. And I'm not going to. I don't want to put myself in that spot. But you know, if you notice a lot of uh, some of the trades that were done over the years, whether it was uh, 
the Delgado tray. I think we talked about that. Yep. It might have been like done during Thanksgiving. Yeah, it was early. I, I, I try to do as much work as I can before the winter meeting. <laughs> yeah. uh, but then when you get there, so I like doing work before the winter meeting. And then why not? Just yeah. do something in the winter meeting. Yeah. Just yeah. go for it. So you were talking about like, you know, there you see one domino fall and then yeah. it feels like the rest. Who do you think this free agency, this offseason, could be that first domino to the fall? Pitchers. The, the pitchers. pitchers. Okay. Usually the pitchers. Yeah. It's usually the pitchers. I think once that domino fall with the pitchers, it's just kind of you have the pitchers, you got the position players, and you got the pitchers. And, you know, once that, you know, the guys that, you know, it's, it's pretty, you know, you know, I mean, the judge market, you don't know where that's going to go. But I think yeah. people are going to say, you know, you tend to believe they're going to, he has, they're going to end up to be, it may not happen. But the pitchers are the ones, because once pitchers are off the board, position players are out there, but pitchers are the ones that, you know, they're, they are in the best position, especially the way the game is right now. Yeah, and there's so many just good free agent pitchers that are on the board right now. We have Justin Verlander, Carlos Rodon, Clayton Kershaw, if he ever leaves. But remember, there's a lot of pitchers, but the premium pitchers, there ain't too many. Yes, no, correct. All, yeah. So that's understand that. You understand? So there's kind of those guys, once the, the, once the premium guys go off the board, then those, those secondary guys, those guys that are kind of the three, the four, the two, whatever they are, these yeah. guys are the number one guys. Of course. How much do you have to multitask in a situation like that where there's only, like you said, a very limited amount of premium pitchers? Like, there's pitcher A, pitcher B, and pitcher C. Like, you're talking to pitcher A, but you think he's probably going to sign. Are you still having a dialogue with pitcher B? Or are you, oh, yeah. ri you risking oh, the yeah. offending pitcher A? Oh, yeah. Different agents? Is that something you no, have to keep No, you got to be talking to everybody. You know, you have to control your situation, meaning your focus on your guy, the guy you want. Let's just say whether it's DeGrom or whether it's... Verlander or whether it's Rondon, you focus on that. And really, you you know, depending, each each general manager is different, each mm -hmm. agent is different. But you know, you are, if you're doing your job, uh, you know, I, I always believe you got to have that option, have B and C option available. Yeah. And understand that, you know, A may not be there, but I'm going to have to maybe be proactive on B. Uh, and, and a lot of it, it's a lot of it has to do a lot of information too. Now, at one time, you know, in, with data, with internet, with social media, there's so much rumors out there. Some of it is true. Yeah. And that's why certain guys, you say to yourself, you know, you really have to do a good study of who are they writing it, who's the source, yep. and how, you know, how much, how much, how correct is this source? And understand that things are going to be thrown out there that are not true because it's all part of the game. Are those the guys with their cups on the door? <laughs> no, no. You know, the so team themselves, you know, say things. Yeah. To and writers have good relationship with agents. Yeah. And agents themselves, it's it's really kind of a rumor mill uh, situation. And it's a look. I, I think experience matter a lot. Yeah. If you don't have experience in how it, how you do it, you end up either paying a, a bigger price. But if you have experience, you kind of you know you have a good plan in place. And and you you're able to uh, look look at look at the t look what's in front of you what the rumors are, find out what that's where experience comes in that, that's kind of that's being just thrown out there, um, but also a lot of it has to do with communication with your owners. Mm. You have to invest a lot of time, so you have a whole day, and each ownership is different. But you, I, I will tell you this: no matter who it is, you are talking to your owner, letting him know before the day starts, and at the end of the day, what happens. Yeah, of course. No, that makes sense. You want to keep them in the loop, and they are the people cutting well, you those should. checks. You should. <laughs> they, yeah, they should. You, I put it. It'd be smart if you're smart to do that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Was there ever a situation at these meetings where you really thought you might have had someone like happened in the Mets last year with Stephen Matz, and then it kind of fell apart outside of your own knowledge? Wow, I've been to so many of them now. So <laughs> I was like, <laughs> you know, uh, you yeah, it's just so many that you think you, you know, um, God, you think that you're there, and then the next thing you're not. Oh uh, God, it, it, yeah, it's kind of like I've been on the other side where teams thought they had <laughs> the, the guy, they had a guy, and they didn't. Sounds way more. You fun. know, I remember <laughs> one. If you want to hear what we thought, you know, I mean, Tazil, I was with the Rangers at the time. Yeah, and uh, you know the. Uh, the Rangers thought they had Tazio signed, and they pretty much did. And we pretty much had, you know, after pretty much they, they cut a deal, and um, it was that, you know, we came in behind the scene and, and got the deal done. I, I don't have a specific one, and it's just that there's been so many after so many years going to yeah. these meetings, you know. Uh, no recent one that I remember. Uh, you know, just nothing. If I think about it, I'll let you know. <laughs> okay, we'll get you next time. Yeah. If there was one, we talked a lot about the pitching side. How about the hitting side of the free agent market? Is there a certain free agent that you see right now that's on the market that you're like, that guy is one of those like 
generational domino type players. Well, the, of course, it's Judge. Yeah, there's no doubt. But I think the name that's that you look at, the, I think Brandon Nimmo has put himself in a very good position for this free agency. I put himself in a good position, first of all, because he's a good player. Great mm -hmm. um, second of all, because he had a good year. Um, a lot of indicators were up, and you want to see indicators going up. Um, he also, he, it helps when you have a good agent, and he does have a very good agent in Scott Bars, yeah. who knows how to play that. Might be the best. Uh, <laughs> and I think, you know, anybody, a guy like him, you know, he plays in the middle of the field, um, quote unquote, in, in a world of data, of information, some people call it analytics. You know, he, he, there's a lot of positive things that he does oh, yeah. that that world, that particular world looks at and likes a lot. Uh, coming off of this, so I think, I think this year the position player wise, I think Brandon Nimmo, I could see this, there's, there's uh, across the board, there's a lot of interest yeah. Yeah. In, in him. Where a guy like a judge, the number's so high, there's only so to me so many people that are going to be interested. Oakland in A's aren't making an offer for Aaron no. Judge anytime yeah. soon. Well, like not, not even like even the A's, like even those middle teams, because we uh -huh. just even the way they set up the CBA now. You sign a guy like that, you're jumping multiple levels. And, and, and the other things too is you know with qualifying offers too. Yeah. You know uh, certain guys that don't have qualifying offers are kind of uh, people like you know that. You know, uh, so the qualifying offer, you'd be surprised. A lot of, it's, it's a big thing for teams. I want, yeah, I wanted yeah. to ask. It's huge for big things. How much of, like, you don't know, necessarily, your own experience, but, like, how much does that qualifying offer actually matter when signing a player? Like It matters because team value uh, draft picks, and they value young players more than ever before. Mm -hmm. So to me, you know, you're speaking to a guy, you know, to me, qualifying offers as, a, as, a, as an organization, giving them up or getting them, mean a lot you know it means a lot so certain guys you know some teams are not they may want to be there but they're not they just be, he's got a qualifying offer so i'm just not gonna i'm gonna hold off on that i'm gonna try to find another solution to that and maybe not give the guy the value that he deserves because i don't i, I really i teams just have value uh draft picks a lot more than they ever did taking brandon Mo out of it you mentioned that he just is coming off very good year this will be the last question we asked too a few minutes left is there anything that general managers, people in baseball, talk about in terms of like some guy has a contract year? When you see that a guy in the direct year before free agency just played the best ball of his life, does that mean anything to you, or is that just something? I have, that you have to pay attention to that, yeah. because I think when you sign a free agent, you don't only look at kind of what his recent uh, uh, year is. Of course, it's you're giving a guy, and if you're sitting, you know, if you're going to invest a long time, you're looking at his value long term. Now, you know. The same vice versa. You always look at if a guy has a bad year, yeah. does it mean that I'm not going to go away from him? Depending what kind of that bad, that bad year, guys will look at a like what kind, what kind of year he had, quote unquote, recent year, present year, all those things. Uh, you look into it and you ask yourself why. Change of scenery. I will tell you this: whenever I sign a free agent to come into New York, I'm always saying to myself, you know, the history is that the, if it's a big free agent. That first year, it not, may not be the same year that he had the previous Definitely, year. Definitely, yeah. yeah. It takes some time. It takes some time for that. We've seen it. You know, it wasn't a free agent, but you saw what happened with Diaz here. I think we saw what happened with Lindor here. I think you saw what happened with Beltran here. Yep. There's a history there when guys come in that first year. So you have to keep that in the back of your mind, too. I would love to talk more about the offseason, yeah. but as we know, you're a busy man and you got a trip home. So we don't want to hold you too much longer. Thank you so much for taking the time talking with us again today. We really appreciate it. And well, I think you guys do a great job. Like I said, it's exciting to work, uh, you know, talk baseball to you guys. I love your passion. The fact that you're a Mets fan. You tell me all the trades when I was making those trades. <laughs> you probably boo me. You say, Omar's oh, this and that, and that's Never. okay. No. And no, if you boo me, and, and if you probably, that's okay because you know what? That's what makes baseball fun. It makes baseball fun, especially in New York. I'm okay that's with that. Man. Omar, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Great job, guys. Get up. Get, get up. Get up.